Hi, this is Mike Torsha, and welcome to Live Well and Thrive. I have three special guests today. I got Pastor Andrew Columbia. I've got Robert Bruzio and Charlie Nicosia. Now, Charlie and I go way back. God, how long? It's been like 40 years? 40 years, Mike. Yeah, I haven't seen this man for like 40 years. He was a t teenage bodybuilder, and I was just, you know, up and coming my uh, career, but I always was so inspired by you because you trained hard. You had a great physique. You still have a great physique. Thank you. Your son has a great physique. He's got your genetics yeah. and your tenacity. So, But I want to thank you for the introduction because it's all about the pastor and his mission and his story, which is incredible. So I'd like you to share your story and let the audience know what you, where you were in the beginning of your life and where you are now and what your plans are for the future. Sure, thank you very much, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I'm an Italian guy from Staten Island, New York. So you guys are from the Bronx, I'm from the other side, Staten Island. Grew up in a family, my father was a police officer, my uncles were police officers, firemen. I was a young kid, a dopey kid who did a lot of stupid things when he was young, didn't know what he wanted to do. When he got older, my father said, why don't you take the test, become a cop? All right, I'll try it. Took the test, did well, became a policeman. Uh, wanted to work in Staten Island, the suburbs where I grew up. I started there. But during training, they said I had a bad attitude. So my training officer said, Columbia, we're sending you to the Fighting Ninth. I said, where's that? He said, the Lower East Side of New York. So I started out in Staten Island, went to New York City, which was the beginning of my story of somebody who grew up in the suburbs, working in the city, and then dealing with the frustration, the trauma, the pressure of being a cop. So when you say cop, were you like walking the beat? Yes. When I started out, I was walking a beat. We would get in the cars also. They'd switch you off. But for the most part, you get a foot post and you're walking in the Lower East Side. That's where I work. Now, during the 80s and 90s, when I worked there, that's when the crack cocaine epidemic just came out. So the streets were loaded with bodies, loaded with people, Bowery and Bond Street, where all the missions are. So here's a kid from the suburbs immersed into the inner city, and I'm walking around in a culture that I knew nothing about. And not to say it, it was a difficult transition, but now trying to deal with what I had to deal with at work, violent crimes, all types of overdoses, seeing things like kids being abused, all kinds of stuff like that. Then you go home to the suburbs. I was a newly married guy, had a young kid. Now I got to go home with my wife and kid. How do you make that transition? Not easy. Now, those, those dinners weren't fun, huh? No, no. I, I, unfortunately, I po punched a lot of holes in walls because my wife would press me and say, what happened at work today? I said, I don't want to talk about it. Why not? I don't want to bring that to the house. I don't want to scare her and tell her things I was seeing and witnessing. So I was taught you never hit a woman. So instead of hitting a woman, I hit a wall. So I would punch holes in walls, then go down to my basement, had a little bar down there, a little man cave, drink, sit by myself until I was ready to go back upstairs and talk to the wife and the kids. So it was, it was difficult for me in those early years. That was insane because you're not just you like here, Robert. Okay. Slide this. Actually, I'm good this way a little bit. Keep okay. putting your face behind it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Right, T gives me okay. Okay, so when you first signed up, you didn't know you were going to be assigned to that area in, in the city. Oh, no. I, I thought I was going to stay. My father had a hook. A hook is a connection. He was a cop. He got me in Staten Island, but I blew the hook because of my behavior. They said I was a little too rough. Give me an example. What happened was there was a dispute in a bank. And this guy starts throwing things around in the bank, scaring all the ladies. I walk in from the put post. What's going on here? This guy's going crazy. I grabbed him by the neck, opened the door, and threw him down the stairs. As I throw him down the stairs, the sergeant pulls up in the car and sees the transaction and said, what are you doing? I said, this guy was scaring everybody in there. He was going crazy. So I threw him out. He goes, that's not how you handle people. So that was his assessment of my police work, which made him think I'd be better off in the Lower East Side where- uh, With the animal. With, there you go. <laughs> so, I mean, you just, know, so you brought up the bank robbery. So yeah. It was when I first came out here, you know, but I was like in my 20s. And uh, I was training this client, and uh, she was supposed to pay me cash. And she said, you know, I don't have cash on me. Can I give you a check? And I said, okay. Uh, she was, but you go to my bank, you can cash it right away. I said, oh, great, okay. And it was a Friday, so I was like, I got to get this check cashed. So I go into Brentwood, and it's a nice little community. It's like suburbs like in yeah. New York. And it was a bank. It was like Wells Fargo Bank. I said, oh, great. I go in there. It was like late morning. Everybody's on the ground. I was like, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> and all of a sudden, um, 
I just see the guy from the teller, like with a backpack, run by me, hit my shoulder. And I'm like, oh, and she say, excuse me. And then all of a sudden, I, the, the guard's on the ground. I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, we just got robbed. That guy just robbed us. I'm like, oh shit. Hey, can I check? Can I chest? I cash my check? <laughs> and they go, what? No. I said, but it's a Friday. I got a cash and check. And he's all I got. I got my groceries. <laughs> and they say, sorry, right. sir. And they said, oh, by the way, he touched you, so you got to stay. I go, nah, I'm going to go to the next bank. Where is it? Mm -hmm. I sent him out. I see you. I left. <laughs> I'm not going to stand around. I'd probably be there for hours and sure. yellow yeah, tape sure, it. Sure, sure, sure. Going to fingerprint me, right? <laughs> you know? And still not getting it. But it's, so, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. I, you know, it was, I can't believe I walked into a bank robbery. Yeah. But you, I know your mindset is right away, I wanted to throw this guy down. For, right. I mean, the way he hit me, like, you know, right. but it's crazy. And then they caught him. Shortly, like like three hours later, the dye, dye pack opened up. Okay. It sprayed yeah, yeah, him. Yeah. He's running along the sunset oh, yeah, like a madman. They you. caught him right away. But uh, I got to tell you something. Man. Um, I can imagine what you went through coming home to your wife and kids and keeping that shit in you. It's like cancer. It eats right. up your mind and your soul, right? So during this transition, is this when you had this build up to the point where you became suicidal? You know, it, it's, it's a funny thing. I don't like saying I was suicidal. I was ready to explode because dealing with the pressures of the job, seeing the things I see, not knowing how to decompress, only way I knew was to go to the bar. So you go to work, then you go, you do a four to uh, four, uh, eight to four, then you go to the bar, you do a four to four and you drink it off with your buddies. Then you go home, then you do it the next day, but you're not really dealing with the issues. You're not dealing with the trauma, but it's trauma. When you're seeing people get killed, ODing, jump in front of trains. I mean, I've saw just about everything you could possibly see at 22 years old. What do you do with it? So, you know, I had a love hate relationship with the job. In one sense, you want to be Superman. You want to make all these arrests. You want to be super cop. But then you got to deal with the, the stuff afterwards. And I didn't know how to process it. So I started getting angry and, and the anger started building up. And over a period of five years, I started, you know, started in Staten Island, like I said, then seeing that stuff in the Lower East Side, it got to a point where I was ready to explode. And one of the guys I work with told me that. He said, Columbia, you look like you're going to explode. And when he said that, I felt exposed. What do I do now? Where do I go with it? So that's what led me to my rooftop encounter. If you want me to tell you about the rooftop yeah, encounter. Yeah, because what I want to bring up, I remember you told me last night over dinner that you had gotten so crazy just because one of your fellow officers Ate your meatball wedge. Oh, you don't eat my meatball you, sandwich. You want to, I'm Italian. I can relate to that. I probably would have given up eating too. My mother made you know? that meatball sandwich. I was oh. waiting all day to eat that meatball sandwich. Let me tell you something. There's nothing better than cold meatball That's right. sandwiches. That's right. My grandmother would cook on Sunday, and the next day I'd tell my mother, Ma, make me the, the meatball sandwich. Put <laughs> lots of sauce. Right, right, Put right. Parmesan. Yeah. Right? And the, and the basil. Not like it, so I, I don't blame you for that one. Right? <laughs> yeah. Pass on that, right? yeah, you get to pass on that he one. He deserved that one. All right, so you got to a breaking point. Yeah. Then how did you think of going to the roof? It's just like, let me go I worked there. the job. I worked the side job doing uh, um, security in Harlem, New York. So I would go from the Lower East Side to Harlem a couple of times a week, make extra money for the family. I was looking to buy a house. So that day after that guy said to me, you look like you're going to explode, I said, what am I going to do now? Now what am I going to do? So I go to the job like I usually do, and I have to go up to the roof, check the roof late at night. Usually it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. Quiet up there, not too many people. So because of that comment, it stirred something in me where I start walking up the stairs. I start talking to God, saying, God, where are you? You know, this world's so screwed up. People are so screwed up. Why are people ODing, raping kids? What, what's going on? So the talking went to yelling. The yelling went to screaming and cursing. Well, I just couldn't take it anymore. I really was exploding, but I was exploding on God. I was having a showdown with God. So as I walk up the stairs and I get to that top of the roof, I burst open the door. I take out my gun and I say, God, if you're real and you're there, what's stopping me right now from blowing my brains out? I want to know why this world's so messed up. I want to know why I'm so messed up. And I want to know now. And when I did that, I did it with every ounce of my being. Now, I thought I was going to get a lightning bolt from heaven and he was going to do me a favor and just end it. But the exact opposite happened. As I'm screaming, yelling, venting, there was something in me that really wanted to know if God was real and if God loved me and why everything was so screwed up. There was, that was real. It was honest. It was raw. And in that moment, I had this epiphany. And the only way I could describe it is this bright light came over me. It was like a tractor beam from heaven. It just came on me. And I felt this presence that was pure love. 
Now, I went to church once in a while, nominal Catholic kid. I always believed in God, always believed in Jesus. So I'm in this presence, and I just knew it was God. I knew it was Jesus. And it was like all those questions, all that anger, all that rage, all that frustration. In one second, he answered it. I can't explain it other than that. He just let me know, I'm here, I got you, I love you, and everything's going to be all right. And that presence was so peaceful and powerful. And and God, I wanted to know what was wrong with me. But it's not only did I have issues on the job. I had issues from my past that were kind of buried. And whenever there would be a situation with a kid getting abused or raped, I'd go berserk. I'd lose it. Where I would snap. And I'm saying, why am I doing this? Why am I acting like this? You know, it's not normal. But it would go back in the closet. I didn't want to deal with it. So in that moment, I said, God, what's wrong with me? I want to know what's wrong with me. And the words came out of my mouth. You were molested as a child. I said, God, if this is true, I want another sign. The words came out of my mouth again. You were molested as a child. I asked three times, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I said, God, if this is true, I want another sign. And the third time I asked, the presence intensified. The light became so bright. And I felt this intense love that my hands just went up in the air. I was speaking in some other language. I don't know what language it was. It was the language of God. And I was feeling this presence and I was so caught up in it. I didn't know if it was a minute, 10 minutes, an hour or whatever. And I'm in this presence and then all of a sudden it stopped and I'm left standing on this roof and I'm like, what was that? My brain kicks in. Was that real? Am I going nuts? Now, how long ago was that? This was 32 years ago, 32 years ago. Okay, so everything didn't change right away, but at least you had a clearer head and you were calming down from being that radical cop, right? A radical man. There were some things that changed instantly. The anger that I carried in me after that encounter left. And that was, it was so funny besides, I always had a scowl on my face, F-bomb every two seconds, aggressive, violent, fighting, all that. I go to work the next day and I'm, I'm not angry. You know, I went home, I told my wife what happened to me at the time. She said, no wonder why you got so much anger. I felt this evil presence inside of me come out. I let out this roar, Mike. It was like, and I felt something evil leave me. Mm. And then I felt that presence of God come again, that peace and that love. I couldn't understand what was going on. But I go to bed, I wake up the next day, I look in the mirror and I look different. I'm no longer scowling. I, I felt there. I felt like a thousand pounds was lifted off me. So I go to work. Who am I going to tell this? They thought I was crazy before. My nicknames were Iceman and Evil because this guy's a lunatic. Now he's a, yeah. now he's a church boy. They're going to really think I snap. So yeah, I can't really tell anybody. Yeah. This, this is crazy. So I go to work and people are noticing it. You look different. What happened to you? The only thing I could say, I'm not angry. That's what I said. Well, you know, what you just brought up yeah. was an, uh, a therapist had shared with me that was on my show about two weeks ago. Uh, she does a sp spiritual life coaching. Mm -hmm. And people that have certain issues in their life, it could be anger management or they, they can't keep a relationship or they can't keep a job. They just have issues. Right. Is she helps them recall what caused it during their childhood. It could be even when you're in the womb. Right you get affected, your mind gets affected. Your personality starts forming while you're in the yes. mother's wound. So she does this tracking for exactly what you did on your own. She does it for people because there's a lot of people out you, like you out there that are angry and miserable, and pessimistic, and you can't trust them. They don't trust anybody. And they're beating themselves up like you did. True. Because something happened, whether it was in the wound, as an infant, in the crib, later on, as their young child growing up. So what happened to you is so typical of why there's so many messed up people in society today. Absolutely. Cause and effect, traumatic events. Yeah. So for me, but my story where I think it's a little different and, and I took all those courses and I take them now and now I help cops. I do training for PTSD, critical incident stress, trauma. I speak at all events and I share my story because what I tell them is the reason why people want to take their life is they feel like there's no hope. There's nowhere else to go with this. I'm, I can't change. Nothing's changing, so it's better if I just off myself. That's how people think when they get hopeless. When I cried out to God with everything I had, and it was take it or leave it, I knew that was it. He met me on that roof. And, and after that encounter, I said, if God can do this for me, if he could heal me, if he could change me, he could change anybody. And that was the shift in my personal life. And then the shift in the job, instead of being aggressive and violent, I was now telling people about God's love, God's peace, because it affected me to that level. I knew that could have been the last day of my life. 
And instead of doing this, now I'm doing this. I'm sharing my story and I'm telling people how God healed me and how there's another way out. And also training and therapy. And that's a huge part of it. Because when I was a cop, they didn't have that stuff. It was this. Mm -hmm. So now I'm an advocate and a part of organizations that do training, counseling, and stuff for police officers. So that's how I give back. Do you still drink? I don't drink. Was there a reason that did you feel you had an addiction or you just thought it was bad for you? Well, I drank to get drunk because I was in pain. I mean, if I want to have a glass of wine once at a blue moon, I will, but I don't drink. It's not a part of my right. regular lifestyle because I only drank to ease the pain. So that was your that was outlet, it. your band aid, outlet. right. Yeah, so so um, when going through all this, and even though you had a media transition, how did your wife react to it? Oh, not good. At first, good because I wasn't as angry. But then when I went after the whole God thing, and I'm just going to be real, you know, I, I went full guns barreled. I'm an all or nothing type of guy. It's how I am. I'm intense. And after that encounter, I just wanted more of God because it changed me so much and it felt so good. I wanted to tell us about it. I wanted to learn more about it. She came along for a while. She tried. I give it that. She tried. But it wasn't in her heart to go as far as I was. And she said this, I married a cop, not a preacher. Oh, what a shame. And mm -hmm. she stayed with me even when I became a pastor. She stayed for a while, and, and she did it because of her kids. And, and I, I, I am grateful that she did that. But ultimately, the calling was too much for her. It wasn't her calling. She didn't want to live the lifestyle I was now living. And I, I understand it. I understand it. But that was the reality of it. So, you know, as much as it brought good things in my life, I got a lot of pain, too. And I had to go through a lot of change after this encounter. So how did your father react? My father, uh, he, he's, a, he's a believer. He believes in God, not to the level or intensity that I was, but he thought I was nuts when I left the police department because I left after 10 years. I didn't get a pension. He goes, what, are you crazy? You're leaving the police? Why are you doing that? I just felt this calling that I had to move on from that and, and, and continue my quest with God, and that's what I did. So I got a lot of adversity from the home, from family members. Why are you doing this stuff? I felt like I had to. So now do you consider yourself still Catholic or just Real, spiritual. Well, I, I consider myself a Christian. Okay. And, you know, born again Christian, that's not a wacky, kooky religion. It's somebody who has a personal relationship with God. And that's what I have. And because of that, it's changed my life. And and really, you know, he died for me so I could live for him. Let me just say that. And that's, that's what I'm doing right now. I, I get it. You know, I was brought up in a, a strict Catholic Italian family. Mm -hmm. So every Sunday, church, Easter, Christmas, Christmas Eve, sure. all the holidays, you got to go Palm Sunday, sure. Ash, Fridays, whatever it was, and fish on Fridays, you know, no, no beef. Yep, yep. So we had a very, my mother was very tough about that. And uh, my father was, you know, yeah, okay. You know, he came from Calabria for the boat when he was 20 years old. He's like, fine, I'm Catholic too. But he, you know, he was like me. We just got to go to church. Right. So I was around eight years old. Um, I just like, started huffing and puffing, squirming around the seat while we're in church on Sunday. My mother goes, what's the problem? I said, ma, this priest can't make up his mind. First he wants to stand, then he wants to <laughs> kneel, then he wants to sit, then he wants to kneel, then stand. Daddy's got a bad back and knee. Yeah. He's struggling over here. I don't get it. Why can't we just sit and listen? And she goes, please, not here. So then I start squirming around. She goes, what now? I said, ma, every time I come here, He's singing the same hymns, saying the same thing from this piece of paper. Why don't you get a little more creative? Something a little more interesting. It's the same thing every Sunday. She goes, you better stop him when you're back out of the mouth. In a minute. <laughs> so stop. So that's what my mother was. Yeah. So finally, on the way home, my mother goes, you really are that unhappy? I said, yeah, because I'm not getting anything out of it. Besides, the priest says, you could talk to God 24-7. I could talk to him in my, my room. And you know, my father goes, you know what? He's got a point. How about you, <laughs> you and Corey and Vic? You go to church on Sunday. Me and him, we'll pray. We stay home for so stay home we'll pray. We can talk to him all the time, twenty four seven. So he goes, fine. So since then, yeah, I didn't go back to church. Right. But some my you know, Sunday, my father would go out. We'd go out on the on the patio and overlooking our farm. You know, and we'd eat cherries. And uh, we just kind of talk about life, my, mm -hmm. allow me to bond with my father better. Right. Mm -hmm. So my mother comes home and she goes, yeah, you're, you're praying with God, right? Eating cherries. <laughs> you're throwing the pits on the floor. Pick them up. <laughs> right? yeah. But the, the fact that my father was, you know what? He made a point. If he feels he still believes in God, he's not saying he doesn't believe in God, but he, don't want, he doesn't want to be like sheep. So that's what my father said. 
in Italian, I can't remember how to say it. He said, it's better to be a one day a lion than a thousand years sheep. He said, oh boy, there's something special. He's not a follower. And I never said, my mother accepted it, right? But, you know, when it was a holiday, I would still go to church, I would mm -hmm. pray. I, I still, on my mother's, on, on my mother's birthday, my father's birthday, and the day that passed, I go to church, I light a candle. I pray, I still do that. I don't go to confession. I'm afraid <laughs> the priest would come scream at me. So I don't do that, but I, I, I am still spiritual, I am still Catholic, but I, I told my mom and dad, I don't feel that I have to be in this room to pray and to talk to God. I gotta tell you something, I have a very healthy relationship with God. I believe me, I pray before my competition. Mm -hmm. I pray to, to God. Everything I have is thankful because of God. So I, I understand your path, your journey, what you wanna do. And so to bring in Robert and Charlie, because you're also a pastor also, correct? No, I'm a deacon. Oh, with, deacon, with that's Andrew. Yeah, like so the I assistant. Serve, <laughs> yeah, I serve the men, Mike. I teach men's ministry. And he's the pastor to the uncommon. Like my story doesn't match anyone saying that guy's gonna be a deacon someday. <laughs> that would never be anyone's prediction of where life would lead me. But that's what that's what happened. Now, now 40 years ago, yeah, it's like that Miley Cyrus <laughs> song, I used to be wild and crazy, <laughs> but we were young, yeah. right? So we had our time. Oh yeah. So to hear you like you are now, mm -hmm. I'm so touched of what you have done yeah. for him, really, yeah. seriously. Because we were around yeah. a lot of crazies, right? Yeah. And it rubs off, you yeah. can't help it. You Don't know? learn behavior. Right? Yeah. Like we pick up what we see and through the family and through the examples ahead of us, just like you said, you were an inspiration to me coming up in bodybuilding because you were already established. And I was like, well, I want to accomplish that someday. That was a desire. And then God took me in a different direction, but it's really about, for us, it's about leaving a legacy. And he's the pastor to the uncommon. Like I said, he draws people from all walks of life. And it, we don't, it's not about religions and traditions. It's really about how do we live this life and how do we do what Jesus did and how do we help other people? That's so God about. first called me into prison ministry, was my first ministry. I would go in and teach the men the Bible, teach them about what that life looks like when they get out of prison. Were they receptive though right away? Well, yeah, Mike, and you know how it is. In the prison, you're looking for that diamond in the rough and they're there, but there's a lot of recidivism going back in but you gotta stay encouraged. You just never know who they're gonna touch. And it's in hope, right? Yeah, and you've seen miraculous stuff come out of that. Absolutely. So Robert, you're working with Charlie and Andrew to actually do a, a film, correct? Yep, absolutely. A scripted reenactment. Full feature film. Right. So yeah, I was, I was introduced to Pastor Andrew through Charlie. Um, I would attend the men's ministries on Saturday that Charlie was a part of. Um, and then Charlie invited me to go to church uh, with Pastor. And next thing you know, you know, I'm hearing Pastor's story and about the transformation. And it's, it's got like all the elements of, of, of a movie. It's got going from dark to light. And then from light, the battle, the struggle of trying to stay in the light. And then, you know, it, it, and it, to me, the movie is not just that rooftop experience that he had. It's all the testing and all the obstacles he did where it was continuously going to be pulled to be that old guy again. But he didn't. He now didn't. you're writing this writing, this yeah, script. writing, so, and, one of the and you're an accomplished uh, movie maker, filmmaker, right? Yes, yes. My so, last, what are some of the things that you've done? Well, one of my most recent films is a film called Bottom of the Ninth. It stars Sofia Vergara, Joe Manganiello. It was produced by uh, Bill Chardoff, who is known for producing Rocky Balboa, Creed. Um, it, it's got a whole bunch of cast. It's been out there distributed. I have several other projects. I'm working with uh, director Raymond DiFolita, who did a movie called City Island. Um, I have another feature that I wrote that Joe Montaigne is uh, um, attached to direct. It's about Skinny D'Amato. So we have a bunch of stuff that's in the works. But right now, you know, um, this story about Pastor just, uh, you know, it touched me on so many levels, you know, e even being a believer myself. Um, and the thing that with pastor, he's just so relatable as a person, as Charlie shared, he's not, you know, it's like he preaches to the uncommon and me, you know, also growing up Catholic, all this guilt that you're, that that's in your mind, that all that you have in your head and, and that you struggle with. And, you know, where does this, all this come from? Listening to pastor, listening to the story was a healing for me. So as a filmmaker, I almost feel responsible to want to put a movie out there that can provide healing for others. Well, you know, what you're sharing with me right now is just incredible because um, I'm actually working with a group right now to build a studio called Kind Studios. 
Oh, wow. It's for content that not just faith based, but people that have content that is about real life experiences, right. positive things, influence of people in such a good way, in a kind way. And recently, um, I was involved with one of these projects that actually a documentary that uh, won best film in the Beverly Hills Film Festival called uh, Kindness Within. Awesome. And this this gentleman travels around the world for a year and a half on his motorcycle and and is meeting people in the streets. And he had no money, he had a mm. backpack, and they welcomed him in his home. He even slept for two weeks in the streets in New York with a homeless man. And the guy shared his food and he was so appreciative that mm -hmm. these people didn't know he's a billionaire. Mm, wow. And he traveled around, mm -hmm. and from the kindness of heart, he went mm -hmm. to Africa and the villages. He's sleeping in a hut, you know? They were cooking for him and had no idea who he was. And then later on, of course, he gifted them mm -hmm. to help them for the appreciation. Sure, sure. So he's involved with this. We're, we're going to kick this studio off and then also create a streaming platform, which is for these type of film projects. So this might, the timing might be perfect. Oh, that's fantastic. So now tell me, who are you thinking for Pastor Andrew? Mm. Come on, what actor? <laughs> First actor that came to mind is a man named Miles Teller. <laughs> I think he's awesome. Um, Pastor agrees, uh, Charlie agrees. Yeah. Um, he just has that character where, where he can be that explosive guy and, and, and for an actor, there's such an arc in this in this role, he would eat it up. It's something that he would just love to do. And how about who would be the director, your ideal director? My ideal director, and I think all of our ideal, ideal director is Mel Gibson. Um, and the reason why Mel Gibson is, uh, you know, he just brings such a rawness, a, a, a truthfulness. You know, you watch A Passion of the Christ. Mm. It's it's not just watching the, the gospel of Jesus. It, it, it's... A piece of art it, it, it's it's he, he did it in such a profound way but also his other movies like uh hacksaw ridge or even braveheart it's like there's so much passion and 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 um and humor you know he brings a level of humor to the movie which, which is something that well, is very you know but that that's his you know his personality even though people only hear about the the bad temper and the craziness the drunken yeah. arguments with the cops he, you know i've worked out with him at the gym mm -hmm. and he's a lovely soul yeah very passionate and very smart about filmmaking. Yeah. Brilliant. And he always says, first thing is great script. Number one. Next is a director that understands the writer's mm -hmm. vision. Right. And then just put good actors. Doesn't always have to be the biggest, right. but good actors. That's what, was, what filmmaking is about. Absolutely. Having all the elements, like a recipe. But right? it's gotta start with the script. Right. You know, you can't get a, a, you can't make a bad script and then hope that everybody else makes it better. You got to start with a great script. Well, you know, when you get the script completed, reach out to me because I know the production company that did Passion of Christ for Mel, very dear friends of mine. I know the distributor distributed Passion of the Christ. And of course I know Mel. So I can help make introductions, but awesome. it's going to be your story that he writes yeah. that's going to really make it because when an actor reads an amazing script and a director reads it they get excited they get mm -hmm. excited the money comes right yeah it's just like you know when you're working you do what you love my father will always say the money will come it's good you know same thing with this project just to give you an example of that john avildsen was supposed to direct bottom yeah. of the ninth and one of the most amazing moments of my life was I was able to a mutual friend send him the screenplay. I get a phone call from him two days later. Robert, I love it. I want to do it. And because of him, we were so many actors, I would say because of the quality of the script, but also because of wanting to work with a great director, John Avildsen. So absolutely, God willing, mm -hmm. he gives me the strength to, and us the strength to develop, a, to write a screenplay that is at that level where someone like Mel would read it and... And Mike, isn't it amazing how you see it all laid out, how all these pieces came together, right? You and I go back 40 years yeah. and I contacted you and you like, oh, just come out, we'll talk. And then Rob came into my life and then mm. the Lord led me to Pastor Andrew's, you know, church. And it's just all these people call them coincidences. They're not, right? Yeah, God, no, there's, there's a bigger plan. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. But you know, when we sat down for dinner last night, it just felt this amazing energy. 
Mm. You know, we were all on the same mindset and the same page with everything. And we're doing something really beautiful. Yeah. A lot of times I sit in these meetings and people are pitching me a movie. I'm like, oh, oh my God, mm. what are they, nuts? <laughs> you know, it doesn't make sense. It's all over the place, you know, but this really makes sense. Yeah, Everything you shared, you know, when someone is such an extreme personality right. and that transition was pretty rapid, even though, yeah, you know, was, you had your ups and downs. Sure. That's a pretty incredible transition that, only God could have changed. That's, that's no it. therapist could have done what they, which you did. That's exactly, it's you know? God, it's God. He and gets all the glory for 32 it. years of it. 32 years. You know, people ask me all the time, cops are very cynical. And when I speak to cops, they want to know evidence. What's the evidence? And I tell them, you're looking at it. You're looking at it. You know, I could have went one way, I didn't. And now everything's about giving back. I call it the reciprocal blessing. Hmm. The greatest gift of all gifts is love, you know? The faith that I have is in Christ because he demonstrated his love towards me by saving me. It's that simple. So I remember you were telling me about when you were arresting these perks. Yeah. So as you're processing them. Fingerprinting them. Well, leading, them to, well, leading them to the Lord, telling them, say, look, I was at a place where I was hopeless. Believe it or not, God can help you. He helped me. Why are you fingerprinting? As I'm <laughs> fingerprinting, I'm praying for them. Can I pray for you? I'm laying hands on them and praying for them. How did they feel? They felt great. It was, it was a level of respect that I never had before God came into my life, because I cared. The difference is I cared. Compassion. See, when you're in authority, you have to understand authority. Yeah, if you care about people that you're over, you're going to treat them right, and they're going to respond right. But when you're a tyrant and you're miserable, hurt people hurt people. But when you're in the process of being healed, or when you get healed like I did from God, now you want to heal people. I'm not into politics. I'm not into religion. I'm into relationship. Yeah. With God and with two greatest commandments, Jesus said, love God, love people. That's simple. That's my life. And it helps me to, to have purpose, passion, and destiny. You mentioned pur purpose, passion, destiny. Because I truly believe I'm on a mission from God, like uh, in the Bellucci Brothers, a mission from God. So <laughs> so tell me something. Have you been yeah. tested? Has, what, uh, did you ever have somebody try to steal your meatball sandwich again? Uh, <laughs> yes, actually. When that, and what did you do? My Aunt Ginger bought a pot of meatballs. I put them in the fridge. One of the guys from South Philly took the pot of meatballs. What did I do? I prayed for him. <laughs> <laughs> he got grace. It's a little different than what you prayed. did before. I had to make did, you, did you have that one little <laughs> yeah, yeah, thumb? Maybe yeah. I don't give him a backhand. <laughs> it, it was an instant. <laughs> my mother. Just about, see, my mother felt like you don't hit someone like close you know, hand like that, yeah, you know, fine, you, that, your right. backhand, because <laughs> the Italians felt like, it's like checking you up. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like check up. So mother right, like, yeah, I got plenty of those. <laughs> no, the backhand. That's a, I you never know, beat my son. I, 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 I once in a while, I give him a backhand in the mouth. <laughs> and then the ring, oh, 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 yeah. oh yeah. did yeah. that hurt. My father used the belt. Yeah. And you know what's so funny? He loved that belt when I, I, I was the black sheep in family. So my father would, if I did something wrong, I, I slammed the door and I broke the glass, he goes, I'll be right back. I knew he was getting the belt. So what I did was, anytime I did something wrong, I went in his closet and I took all the buckles off the belt. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, so he goes in there, he goes, head. what the what hell? Is? What the hell? Where's the buckles? I go, well, I know you're going to hit me, so you don't understand when you hit me with the belt, it stings like hell. He actually looked at me. He goes, ah, oh, you never hit me again with the belt. Wow. Mm. Wow. Because I, I was really, I was Scared, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I was so scared. Sure, because it really stung. You hit with that bubble, sure. that, that yeah. shit, right? And the, and I saw the transition in my father. My father started shifting because I started speaking out. Mm. I said, "Listen, I know I deserve the beating, but hit me with the belt without the buckle. <laughs> I could take it. <laughs> that buckle, oh, my, hold on, you know. <laughs> I, I gotta tell you something. It was a shift. So my father was a tough, tough attack. Right. So I understand what your mindset is. Mm. You know, you got that mentality." It's really hard to, as my mother would say, you know, the Calabrese, they got the, the yeah. thick head, thick, thick skull. Yeah. And my father used to go, I used to say, you go, good, son. The soft head, you know what I mean? <laughs> but in an Italian family, you talk things out, you know? Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you something, your story today and seeing how you, my, my dear friend Charlie, now my new friend Robert, you, you're working together. Whatever I could do to help you out. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, that's thank you. Much yeah, appreciate it. Thank yeah, you, thank you for having us here today. Yeah, yeah. This oh, awesome. man, this is, you know, this is like a family reunion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Family. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, exactly. you know, like. stay in touch when, when you get done with the script. You know, let me look at it. Let me see what I can do. It's, you know, my uh, pleasure to help out in any way possible. Thank you. You know, because this is, this is important. Because yeah. today, 
Look how messed up society is. Oh yeah. It's just it's just terrible. Everybody's at each other's throats and you know, hating each other because someone's a a Republican, a Democrat, an independent. You can have your political opinions, but love each other. That's right. right. And this movie has none of that. It has right. none of the political. Right. It's got none of the uh it's all about loving you. Basically, we want to as entertainers entertain you, right? We want it to be engaging. We want it to be a, a great story yeah. ab above all else. But hopefully that in that entertainment touch them. People Absolutely. walk away with with yeah. a great message. That's fantastic because you know, I created this show called Live Well and Thrive to be not just about fitness and nutrition and yeah. diets. You know, you watch YouTube and you see the keto, the intermittent fasting, you hear the alkaline water sure. and the cold, ice cold baths, you know, that's okay. And I do bring some of that on, but my show is about living life as a quality life and to thrive in every way, mm, mentally, right. physically, and emotionally, and spiritually. So I, again, I want to thank you for coming thank on. You, uh, thank, thank you, you Mike. This thank was you. beautiful. Thank you so much. So I want to sign off and say, please, we need your support. So thank you for watching Live Well and Thrive, and we love for you to subscribe. It's important. Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching this episode. Got great news. The merch is ready. You're going to see an array of all kinds of great products. Go to operationfitness.com. If you want to order anything, click on my store. Thanks for your support.